Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Plant from Redpoint, and I'll be moderating today's event. We're really happy to have you join us here today. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, George Carjado, CTO of Redpoint Global. George, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. I'm going to be talking about us optimizing customer engagement, you know, and that's quite a packed term, optimization customer engagement what is engagement what's really a customer you know there's a lot of definitions of that depending on whether you're a um, uh, an insurance company a healthcare company a retail company what is a customer is it a donor is it a member is it a patient those kinds of things so we're going to cover a, a lot of material here so talking about customer engagement you see we've got this little icon here and it um, it covers a number of different areas, personalized experiences, ultimately that's what you want to get to, next best actions. Uh, it's just like any relationship. You want to say the right thing at the right time, and that single customer view. And as you see in the icon, uh, we really thought a lot about this icon and, and how to represent uh, how all of these pieces fit together. Because you see at the bottom, you've got all of these interconnections, right? And Data is the, the nervous system, if you will, of this entire environment. Everything is sensed through data. A brand senses what people do through data. And, uh, and when those connections occur, it's almost like the synapses firing in your brain. There's a moment, there's an opportunity, an action is taken, a message is delivered, and it could be through a particular channel, a device, a location, that moment that matters. The whole idea is to bring this together in a way that delivers a very uh, coherent experience for the customer of your brand and, um, and in a way that really reduces the friction of uh, their experience. Because today, um, in the world of internet, the whole premise of the internet and all of the uh, promises the internet will make your life easier. Why do we use Google? Well, because it makes our life easier. And as a result, the exchanges, we give up a lot of data. Well, brands uh, are, are, are struggling a little bit with how do I make my customers' lives easier? How do I reduce the friction of their lives? Because that is the expectation these days. So how do we get there? And the way we get there is we've got to have a very uh, a holistic uh, approach to solving these various problems. No longer can they be in silos. No longer can IT work on the data and marketing work on the marketing and the two worlds never meet. All of this has to happen in a very uh, holistic way. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we get into the details of that, what I'd like to do is maybe just um, chat philosophically here for one second. And if you think about luck, you know, a, a luck or opportunity happens when you've got some type of good fortune or something positive happens, but it seems like it's the result of just pure random chance, right? And and the question is, you know, I guess what do you do about that? How do you how do you influence that? Well, it's hard, you know, there's superstitions, there's lucky charms, there's all sorts of things people do to try to get lucky, but the fact is it's very difficult to actually do anything to persuade the fickleness of chance to come your way. You can ask all the folks that, uh, um, you know, run through Vegas how well that type of superstition and stuff works for them. Now, there are different views of luck and what it really means, because if you think about, you know, the world of science, science is very predictive and very deterministic, and, you know, and, and, and there's certainly a good bit of marketing that is science, and we employ scientists as part of that to try to figure out, well, is there a formula, is there a predictive model, is there some way of predicting what's going to happen next. And, and certainly, all the way back to Einstein, you know, there is this belief, or Einstein held this belief, and others have since, that there is such a thing as, uh, you know, gauge theory, uh, the theory of everything, and that, you know, his famous quote, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Now, I've got to admit, as a scientist, I do have a certain um, uh, kind of belief in this, but the problem is, Nobody's figured out the formula yet. So where does that leave us? In this um, marketing world, in this engagement world, how do we create 
our own luck so that or how do we how do we do the things we have to do so that we can get lucky with and and have that fortuitous moment happen with our customers, our donors, our members, our patients, whatever that might be. So I, I, um, I, I, you know, thinking back to Seneca and the comments here, I really like to focus on this comment about luck because it helps us really break down what is possible and what I can do. How can I take action uh, to increase my luck? So the, the the concept is luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity and you know that that has a long history in our language about you know you know the the opportunity uh, knocked and I was ready to open the door you know and those kinds of ideas so if we take this approach and and kind of follow that a little bit let's think about how that looks in the world of engagement and and how we prepare for it right so let's first talk about opportunities what are opportunities for engagement and the fact is is that opportunities for engagement are widespread they happen uh, millions of times a day uh, across devices across channels across um, uh, with the, the the web the internet the uh, uh, mobile apps whatever it may be those those opportunities are there and um, so so the, the, the whole idea is now, if there's so many opportunities in the world of IoT, you know, that's just multiplying these opportunities quite dramatically. In that whole world, how do I, how do I get myself ready? And how do I understand these opportunities when they occur? Because uh, opportunities are fleeting. Um, you know, when you have a moment that you're on a phone with somebody or you're at a device like a coffee brewer or you're at a retail store with a clientele application, whatever that may be, that device, that moment, that opportunity, that window is going to last long. So how do you detect that it's happening? How do you prepare yourself to be able to respond to it in context, in that moment, in a way again that fulfills the promise of reducing the friction of my customers life right so that's really you know kind of the the opportunity we have so the question now becomes how do we prepare for that how do we how do we get ready what do we have to do as marketers as um, as donor managers as uh, engagement managers what do we have to do in order to um, really prepare for that so what do you do to prepare well what we do to prepare is that you first of all have to know everything that's knowable about your customer or your patient or your donor or whoever that person is and and that sounds um, it, it, it can sound a little strange, but but there's a lot that's knowable about people. If you think about your devices, your phone is tracking every five seconds your location. Um, you know, uh, there are social networks that reveal how you feel about things when you lit that candle for your birthday party. So there's a lot that's knowable about people and people are generally okay letting other people know as long as the, 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 the exchange of value is there, right? So there's a lot that's knowable but that puts a big challenge on organizations to know everything that's knowable about a customer. The second thing is that you have to analyze everything, test everything. There's, um, I think, a little bit of bias right now around the world of machine learning where um, uh, we have, we believe machine learning is this panacea. It's going to, you know, uh, figure everything out for us and just do everything for us. Well, it can do a lot and it will certainly do a lot for you in a very automated way but the magic of machine learning is its internal testing ability it's the ability to detect a solution surface and then optimize in that solution surface and it can detect changes in that solution service surface and everything so 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 the ability to actually test and think about what you're doing and trying and testing and failing fast and trying again and iterating through very, very quickly, that's 
that is absolutely um, a must-have skill and expertise that every organization uh, needs to really fully engage. And then there's execution. And I, I had a very interesting discussion yesterday with someone who was trying to convince me that nothing matters other than Facebook data. And I'm not going to argue that Facebook data isn't incredibly revealing about the preferences and likes and, and moments in a person's life. But data is just data. And no matter how much you analyze it, data doesn't monetize itself. The only way you monetize data and insight is through taking flawless action at the right moment through the right vehicle. And, and so that is a critically important element of being able to do and prepare because if you only have a fleeting second when I'm in front of my brewer or a fleeting moment when I'm talking to somebody on the phone, whatever that may be, the stakes are really high and the message has to be exactly right for, uh, for that, that promise of, of making my life easier to really be fulfilled. So you've been out and about through your day, and uh, you come home, it's late in the afternoon, you walk through your front door. And what happens when you walk through the front door is that your phone uh, breaches a geofence that has been defined at your front door. Immediately your refrigerator wakes up, welcomes you home, and says, here's some recipes for tonight, and here is the estimated cook time for these recipes. And oh, by the way, because you shared your Fitbit data with the supermarket that happens to know the, your preferred recipes, your inventory of food in your refrigerator and in your cupboards, and your fitness goals, I'm going to provide you three recipes that all fit within your profile, and again, try to make your life simpler that way, right? And so, so there is a situation which is, frankly, not very far off, where you might have a smart refrigerator. That refrigerator has a subscription to a supermarket. That supermarket just refills your inventory automatically. Um, you've perhaps shared your Fitbit data through your mobile phone, and all of a sudden, it can make uh, all these suggestions that can make your life a whole lot easier because all of us, when we come home and you have kids or you're by yourself, whatever it may be, you're thinking, okay, had a long day at work, what do I do next? I've got to cook, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. How do I make that easier? And this is an example of how the digitization of this experience, of, of many experiences, uh, can really change uh, that level of ease and facility with which uh, people go through their lives. So this is that value exchange that then is going to um, uh, really benefit the consumer and bring the consumer closer to your brand. So what I want to talk about is, you know, different levels of the value that's created, right? So let's get into the details a little bit. I think we, uh, we get the idea. Now, how do we get there, right? So you know, for many years, there's been a lot of talk of, you know, integrating data and bringing everything together. You know, it was the world of direct mail years and years and years ago, and that was the channel, right? Everybody sent direct mail. And then we started getting a little more complicated, and you started having inbound and outbound messaging. You have multi-channel uh, messaging. Um, and to a large extent, we're, we're still kind of stuck in that legacy right now because what happens today, uh, and, and to a surprising extent, is that we have um, uh, a lot of companies that are really largely one channel or maybe two, and that's it. That's all they do is, is kind of churn through those channels and those activities. Um, and, um, and, and so there's a little legacy there. And one of the problems with that um, is that the data resides in these uh, um, in these uh, um, different uh, uh, channels so um, so it's very it can be very complicated to have 
a real uh, unified view of what uh, of what uh, customers are doing. So let me go ahead and now real time comes in and um, again people think this is the panacea you know real time everything everybody wants everything in real time but real time doesn't really make sense for everything and there are trade-offs like anything else in technology there are trade-offs but it's really useful in the right context the real magic happens however when you take all of this and you bring it all together into really perfected personalization and customer engagement so you have to have all these capabilities you've got to be able to talk not just through one or two channels but all channels. You've got to be able to respond to people not in an outbound only way or an inbound only way, but through both. And you've got to be able to do it consistently. And that's really the key. And 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 in order to do that, you've got some uh, you've got some real challenges because the first thing you've got to do is integrate data, then do the analytics, and then orchestrate. So so let's talk about that a little bit and and what that really means. You know, the first part of it is the integrated data. Data is the sensory system for this entire uh, uh, platform, right? It's through data that you sense what people are doing. But in order to know who is doing what, you've got to have everything identified. So what does that mean? That means that when George Corajedo, who lives in Wayland, shows up at a store, and George Corajedo, who has these three email addresses, shows up on a website, or George Corajedo that has this particular mobile phone and uh, browses a um, uh, an app, or George Corajeda, who might have four different uh, uh, social handles, whenever any of those Georges or those proxy identities for George appear, well, then I've got to know about it. If I'm a brand and I want to have a real personalized engagement with my customer, but that's hard. And that's one of the things that's a must have. You've got to be able to curate that data across all channels with no exception. It's almost like we are engaging with people and we humans have five senses. Imagine if you don't have one or two of your senses. Well, you're working at a deficit. The other ones have to compensate and it's never perfect, right? It's hard. It's hard to make up for those disconnected uh, sensory elements the same way in an organization. The data has to be connected and there can't be any deficits of data otherwise there's going to be blind spots that in, in how you deal with your uh, customers. The next is analytics. The world of analytics is uh, very different today. I've mentioned machine learning and what it can do. Um, there's a great deal of promise and evolution that's happening there and applications are many uh, for machine learning. There's also uh, you know some traditional techniques that are also very valuable. But the but the traditional you know build a model for you know two months, then roll it out twice a year, that's not going to happen. You've really got to model and test everything and you've got to be able to sometimes make snap decisions and let the analytics, and the reason we call it inline analytics is that the analytics at times have to just have direct control of the machine to be able to make the best thing happen. There is There are occasions where you don't have the time for human intervention. The machine's just got to be allowed to operate. And then finally, there's got to be contextual decisions. We've got to be able to make those decisions in those moments. And again, that goes back to how do you how do you really perfect that in such a way that um, that you can um, uh, execute and and deliver that value, the right message, whatever that may be, uh, at the moment when it matters most. You know, Google coined this term, you know, the moment, you know, that that moment of truth, right? The zero moment of truth. Well, I think there's there's a great deal of value in that concept and from an execution perspective, the question always is, well, how are you going to execute? What are you going to say in that zero moment of truth? And are you going to be prepared? Let's go back to our analogy. The opportunities are everywhere. This is how an organization prepares to take advantage of that opportunity. Okay?
So what I want to do here is now dig in a little bit because there's a lot of details to this, you know, and there's a lot of complexity out there, right? The world is exploding in devices. Um, you know, we have multiple clients where we're working with, uh, as you know, I showed you earlier, the uh, the uh, smart refrigerator, obviously mobile phones, ATMs. Uh, uh, vehicles are very much now a target wearables of various types. Um, we're, we're working with companies that are working with uh, patients that might be uh, sitting at home with some type of chronic disease and um, they're receiving messages based on the telemetry of their condition, um, uh, of their vital signs of whatever it may be. Um, so, so there's lots of opportunity for this. I mentioned the breaking the geofence with your phone. There are smart televisions. There's, there's just, just a, a multitude of ways of engaging with people. And the question is, number one, can your system connect to those? That's really important because you've got to be able to interconnect to all of these. And then when you're connected, can you uh, interact with it at the proper cadence? So. You see the three topics here, the connected data, inline analytics, and intelligent orchestration. Let's look through these things, right? Because um, it's easy to say you've got to have all the data from all the sources, et cetera. But you know, data's got to be ingested. Data and metadata have to be understood to know what data is coming from where. Data has to be high quality data. Um, and particularly if you get into things like healthcare and others, that data has to be not just high quality, it's got to be exact, it's got to be right. Um, so, so how do you ensure that? What are the standards? How do you process the data in such a way that you can uh, correct it, you, well, you parse it, you correct it, you complete it, you format it, and you get it into the structures that you need? and then you transform it and you have this ability to resolve identity across all these sources doing it probabilistically, heuristically, machine learning, a variety of different approaches that let you understand from a marketer's perspective when a fully anonymous person shows up on my website, how do I gather that data and keep getting smarter and smarter and show them more and more personalized content until I can get them to a fully resolved identity, right? That process is a process that every marketer goes through. That's something that has to be done effectively and quickly. Now the inline analytics, so we talked about that. What are the right models? You know, one of the things that I know as a statistician is that the most important question or the most important step in doing analytics is asking the right question and asking it in a way that an analytic tool can answer it, right? So with all of these new tools, those questions and how they're asked are changing. Um, but one thing has not changed is the importance of having a strategy behind those questions that can point the algorithms in the right direction. You know, algorithms are like scalpels, right? They can they can save a life or they can do a lot of damage. And so you've got to have the right strategy that says, this is what I'm trying to achieve. These are the metrics I'm trying to optimize. And now I can take my algorithms and point those at those metrics to then really drive value. And then finally, the orchestration. The orchestration, people take for granted. They think it's just an email or, or a real-time decision, but it's really complicated. And it's particularly complicated as we get into the world of IoT, as we get into inbound and outbound, and all of this happening from one single point of operational control. And I want to emphasize that because if you don't have that single point of operational control and you have an email system separate from your web, separate from this, separate from that. Now you've got different technologies, different best practices in each one of the channels, teams that are single channel focused, data is now trapped in those technologies, and it becomes virtually impossible to execute a coherent strategy across all those channels. So in order for that uh, to fix that problem, you've got to defragment that environment and bring everything together into one place. So that puts a lot of demand on the technology to be able to interconnect to all of these things, to the entire ecosystem of engagement. And that's 
uh, something that not mer many, very many tools can do, but that is something that is absolutely essential. Single point of operational control, single point of data control. It's the only way to have optimized engagement of your customers, your patients, your donors, whatever your constituencies are. So now, as you can tell, we're getting we're, we're peeling back the layers and getting a little more uh, and a little more technical. And I wanted to show you this because this is kind of a generic footprint, but it is the type of footprint that's happening all over uh, uh, industry. It's happening from healthcare to retail uh, to insurance. Uh, to travel and transportation, uh, hospitality, this pattern is happening more and more. And what is that pattern? Well, if we start from the right, you see people coming in from the right and data coming in from the right. We've got websites and we've got device data. Device data is everywhere today. And, and so we've got device data coming off of websites in the form of DMPs and, and that type of data. And you see a mention of Crux there. We work very closely with them and, and, uh, and have a very nice integration working with Crux. But whatever that data is, it's, got, it's going to come in at a velocity that has to be managed. And one of the things that we have here is our cloud footprint. And what the cloud environments offer us is a set of tools that allow us to manage this high velocity data very, very effectively. In Azure, it's called the Event Hub or the IoT Hub. And what it allows you to do is subscribe to data that's happening at a at, a, at an enormous cadence and then stream it in, manage that stream, subscribe to data, market it use, save it if you need to, let it uh, evaporate if you don't. But it, it really is, is very, very effective at doing that. AWS has tools like that and you can even do things like this on premise, but it really works best in cloud environments with things like the event hub. Now that data comes in and it comes in and you see a Hadoop cluster there and that Hadoop cluster is quickly becoming the central ingestion point of all data for organizations that are doing digital transformation, digital engagement or enterprise engagement. And why is that? You know, people, you know, Hadoop for many years was this novelty. Ooh, it's this new technology. And, you know, there were conferences all around Hadoop and everything else. Well, Hadoop is now just a mainstream technology. Everybody's got Hadoop in one form or another. And the reason it's so valuable is not because it's cheap storage, which is a big misconception. It has more to do with the fact that it, it makes data ingestion very, very easy. You don't have to abide by any kind of format or structure to land any and all data in there. So if you want to land customer data, fine. Device data, fine. Weather data, fine. You just dump it in and it receives it and then you can figure out what to do with it. So as a data ingestion point and then secondarily as a scalable processing platform, it is an indispensable tool in a modern environment, in a modern data environment. Now that doesn't mean that we don't use structured databases. We still do and you can do quite a bit. Lots of applications still require those types of databases to operate. And so with tools like Redpoint Data Management and others, we take that data, we process it, we do all of our master data management inside of Hadoop, and then shoot data out to endpoints where that data is required, but only the data that is required, right? So we'll shoot data out to a SQL data warehouse, or to some other database, whether it's SQL or Oracle or whatever it might be, it doesn't make any difference. The fact is, is that you shoot just the data that's needed for that particular level of operations, right? The other place you place data or you uh, enable that type of interaction with the data is in your real-time environments because there's more and more demand on real-time decisions, whether they be uh, on the website or any other synchronous interaction, right? Whether you're on a call center, your mobile application, a device, I'm standing in front of my, my brew or my refrigerator, you've got 10 seconds, 
how do you, number one, detect someone's there, and then number two, how, you, how do you prep? How do you get ready to deliver just the right message? Well, you've got to use some different technologies for that. Machine learning is a very powerful part of that, but there's also all sorts of triggers and other types of data that you can uh, pre-stage with rules, with machine learning algorithms, et cetera, to really drive that type of decisioning, whether it's in a website, dynamic landing pages, call center, whatever that may be. But that real-time infrastructure has to be able to support a lot more than a website. And that's something that people have to keep in mind when they're looking at these infrastructures. A lot of companies talk about this, but can they really do it? And and and, and you as, as the, the buyers of these systems really have to ask some hard questions. You know, can this real-time decision really and easily and realistically support other synchronous interactions? Yes or no? Is it fast enough? Right? Uh, there are there's a lot of there are a lot of technologies out there, but realistically, to be in a time frame that is useful for a website or any other synchronous interaction, you've got to have a 50 to 100 millisecond response time. It really can't be a lot more than that, right? So, can the technology that you're being pitched really do that? right? Can it work across, can it receive generically any kind of request from a real-time interaction through a RESTful service, right? And, I, and I'm getting a little technical, but with all of this, there's these ideas, a lot of them are not new. There's been a lot of promise and a lot of hype around, oh, we can do this, we have the walled garden, we have all the technologies. But the fact is, you start peeling back the onion, and there's a, the, the devils are always the devils always in the details, right? So ask questions, partner with your technical teams, and really dig into whether these technologies can do the things that they promise. And I can tell you that you know uh, uh, there's a lot that can, and there's a lot that can't. And you guys have to figure that out. What I can tell you is the reason our customers are so satisfied is that our technology works as advertised and our people deliver as advertised. And that is something we're very proud of and very protective of. But that's the challenge. You've got to bring to other vendors. Does the technology work as advertised really? And does the, do the people deliver as advertised? Okay. So let's go ahead and move along here. Now, as a user, what do these technologies look like? You're thinking, oh my God, I've got this cloud environment. It's really complicated, really technical. We've got Redis caches and all that stuff. But here's part of the answer to whether things really work as advertised. This doesn't look difficult. This is a very simple, um, a very simple screenshot here. You've got objects on the left. I drag them, I drop them, I put some arrows in between. What this represents is a very simple interaction that says, I'm going to manually launch a batch selection that's going to send out an email to everybody, and then I'm going to wait. And that's what this interactive activity is. I'm going to wait for someone to do something, and if they do, if they click on something, I'm going to send them an SMS. And there is no coding here. There is uh, not uh, you don't have to dig around in a database. You don't have to rely on your IT department. All of this is as simple as it looks. Drag and drop, connect the icons, and hit go, and it will work. You want to go a little more exotic, and you want to go and listen for a real-time event, like a transactional uh, type of email. Well, that's what the headphones are for. It's to listen. To listen. We've got these, the, the, this concept of listening to data, to probe data, that real-time data that was coming in through that event stream. We've got that ability to listen to that data and then act on it immediately. In some cases in marketing, you might want to do that if you have a order confirmation email with your shopping cart. You might want to do that if you've got a patient whose vital signs are suddenly uh, 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 peaking. Uh, you, there's many circumstances where you may want that type of immediate activity. And again, it's just a matter of dragging, dropping, pointing it to the data, and just telling it what to do. And doing it in very simple drag and drop terms. 
Um, from the data perspective, you know, I've talked about crossing all sorts of boundaries of data around Hadoop, around traditional data sets, all this stuff. And one of the things that I'm sure many people have learned or heard about Hadoop is the difficulty in getting skills required to really utilize things like Hadoop. Again, we eliminate the difficulty. As you can see, the data platform that allows you to work across Hadoop or any other database from one application, from one interface, and even build a single job that allows you to grab data in SQL Server, in Teradata, merge it, run it through Hadoop, and drop it in Oracle if you want, is again drag and drop. There is not a single line of code necessary to operate across Hadoop and your entire data environment. And see, and that's, that's part of what really makes this real, is the ability to, you know, the concepts have all been there, but the logistics, the difficulty, it's hard to get the right skills, it's hard to move the data, it's hard, there's all these things that are hard, and, our, and these applications just make it easy. There's, we train people in a matter of a week to work with either one of these applications, and in a week I can take a DBA, train them on the application, they're operating on Hadoop just like they're operating on SQL Server. There is no real difference in the application, and 100% of the application works in both places exactly the same. And then finally, you know, there's visualization, there's pretty uh, objects, there's the ability to graph data, you know, we have all sorts of widgets and dashboards and capabilities to be able to go in there and quickly say, hey, give me a quick little screenshot of how my real-time decisions are working and show me the best piece of content. Or, um, you know, of the emails that I sent, how many were targeted, delivered, duplicated, failed, opened, clicked, etc. Or across different gaming segments, you know, how am I doing in these different, uh, um, uh, different gaming segments and, and, uh, and, and responses and so on. So, so the whole idea of being able to visualize data quickly and agilely and then make it go away, that's all built into the platform too because again, as, as I, I mentioned, bringing it back to the, the earlier uh, discussion of, of um, being able to do this uh, with uh, a proper strategy, you know, a strategy is not a static thing. It's a con it's a continually evolving, uh, best thinking, best idea, looking for opportunities, attacking those opportunities. And if you don't have this data uh, exchange and this information exchange readily at your fingertips, you will struggle in modifying and evolving your strategy. So this is critically important to supporting that sophisticated strategy or that evolving strategy that you might bring to the platform. And that's what really makes, you know, gets us excited is when companies do that. So I will work through this quickly, but this is a client of ours that has brought a wonderful strategy to the platform. This is Antera, a company that uh, is a hospitality company. Many of you may have stayed at some of their properties. They run many of the, the hotels at the national parks, but it's not a household name. But what they've done is that they actually uh, really applied the principles that we talked about here. What did they do? The first thing is they recognize that they have lots of opportunity. <laughs> lots of hotels, lots of people, lots of engagement. They've got everything from um, uh, hotels to cruise ships to gift shops to stable operations where you take the donkeys down to the Grand Can to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. They've got so many ways of engaging people that they had to get all this data together from all these different sources and really understand who these customers were and what are the things they like to do and how do you understand who they are and, and create that golden record that says this is George Corajedo across physical world, social world, e-commerce world, 
and digital world or social or, or or mobile world, right? And brought all that data together. And the second thing was to really run the analysis. As we talked about, really understand how do these people, what are their preferences? How do they profile out? How do we um, really take our assets and leverage them to the greatest impact? One of the things that they did, which is really a remarkable uh, part of expanding the engagement, is that they start talking to you weeks in advance of arriving at a property. Let's say, for example, you're going to the Broadmoor, which is one of their big golfing properties. Weeks in advance, they're analyzing the weather, letting you know what you should be wearing uh, and contingencies in case it's going to be too wet for golf. They let you know what the spa appointments might be looking like so you can book your spa appointments in advance. If you're bringing your kids, they'll know to remind you to bring uh, the proper pool equipment for your kids, for the kids' activities that they'll have scheduled every day. And you'll be receiving a, a, a whole cadence of emails uh, that are preparing you. And you'll have a mobile application that is preparing you for your stay. So now your stay isn't just the week you're there. You're already anticipating and thinking about it and preparing for it weeks in advance. So your experience of their brand has already elongated by weeks. Now you're at the property. Now what happens at the property? Well, they have a whole digital experience that can happen at the property with real-time uh, location-based targeting of messages. You know, some of their properties are out in beautiful wilderness, and who knows, maybe there's a grizzly in a lake, and they want to let you know real quick so you can come and see that. These are the magic moments that happen um, when you're out in uh, in in uh, these different locations that can um, that can make make or break a, a trip, right? You might have a botanist that's a guest at the hotel and can walk you through some of the background on the flowers. You might have uh, a um, a, a fourth available in or an opening in a foursome for an extra round of golf, right? You might have you know, uh, a, um, a, 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 a guest there that's an astronomer that can walk you through the midnight sky, right? So all of these little opportunities that could happen uh, on a crowdsourced basis because it could just be lucky chance that there's a guest that knows these things. It could be happenstance with the, uh, you know, so a last minute cancellation at the spa or, ga or at golf, or it could be, like I said, a grizzly bear in a lake, but whatever it is, the ability to let you know so that you can share in those magic moments, that's part of the digital experience. That's customer engagement in a, uh, a hospitality and sometimes in a wilderness setting, right? So it can be applied to anything. Uh, the question is, how are you going to evolve a strategy that lets you do it? And what you'll see here in the next slide is the fact that it is incredibly powerful in terms of results. What you'll see here is that not only were revenues from this type of engagement off the charts positive, but they achieved it with fewer contacts. Now imagine that. Imagine how accurate and how effective this messaging is when you're generating more revenue per message and you're doing it with fewer contacts. That's powerful. That's accuracy. That's precision. That's the magic of having the data all linked together the analysis running in the right cadence, in the right format, and the ability to execute regardless of what channel, what moment, what circumstance the customer may find themselves in. So there's tremendous power here for every type of organization. Uh, every organization that has constituencies has the opportunity as we talked about millions of opportunities a day to make a difference in your customers and your patients and your donors and your members' lives and deliver on that promise of reducing the friction of their lives. And to keep in, in, the, in the spirit of luck, I just want to say that if you um, 
do choose to roll the dice, uh, make sure you roll the red point dice because we will not let you down. Um, our customers are the most satisfied out in the market and it has everything to do, as I said before, with our technology working as advertised and our people delivering as advertised. So with that, I'm going to move to the last slide here and, um, and, and say thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to participate and listen in to the webinar and we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, thanks so much, George. If you'd like to access the our new Mind the Gap ebook, you can see it featured here as well as information you've heard today, including solution or you've heard today on our website, redpoint.net.com. Uh, you can see solution briefs, case studies, and white papers. Before we kick, kick off the Q&A, one last reminder to submit your question by typing it into the questions box on your control panel. And I want to let everyone know we'll be forwarding a link of this recording to you in a follow-up email the next day or so. Okay, so our first question is, to George, uh, we already have quite a few point solutions that do much of this, just not in a coordinated way. Can I still leverage the interaction systems and MarTech MarTech technologies that I have? Absolutely. That's a great question. You know, um, there are companies out there uh, that have, that bring the walled garden approach, right? They've acquired lots of technologies and they say, okay, you know, basically you got to do a floor scrape and put in all our different technologies for the magic to happen. But the truth is that rarely works. Um, a lot of those technologies, even when acquired by a company, don't integrate. And they're not integrated, or they overlap, and there's confusing functionality. The approach we took was very different. We said, look, lots of companies are going to have technology out there, and some of it's good. So instead of getting rid of it, how do we make the whole thing work better? How do we create the connective tissue that brings all these pieces together so that, as I mentioned before, you have a single point of operational control so that you never have to log into a bunch of technologies. You just log into one, Redpoint. From Redpoint, you can control your third-party email provider. You can control your real-time decisions on the web. You can control your SMS. You can control all aspects of the interactions from one application. And so we think about that connective tissue, how we connect to it. We've architected our technology specifically for this activity, and we can do it very, very rapidly at very low risk. Because a lot of times people read integration as risk. It's not. We have over 120 connectors already built that we built, we maintain, we certify with the product. We don't have third parties you know, creating things and breaking things. We build it all. We certify that they work. We keep up with all of the different changes. And when you get the solution and when we plug in and connect your different technologies in your ecosystem, the system will work as advertised. Great. Um, now our next question, can one of the listening sources be a contact center feed? Absolutely. Contact centers so often are almost like a silo, right? And and they they are obviously a wonderful place to be detecting what's going on with customers. In fact, from a retention perspective, contact centers play a really important role because that's where you often get the uh, the, the upset customer that had something go wrong on a website or something and they want to complain to somebody. Well, that contact center person in that moment has got one shot to say the right thing. And the best way to ensure that they do say the right thing is to have that contact center person and their systems tightly coupled with what's going on in the rest of the environment so that you are both listening but also supporting that agent with the right information, right? So uh, we've built systems in the past where an agent can quickly check a few boxes as they're talking to customers and then that re-renders a real-time decision, right? So there, there's absolutely a, a bi-directional interaction that can be very powerful at the call center. Great. Our next question, uh, I saw that you had graphs open earlier. Are rapid drag-and-drop reporting systems available through Redpoint? 
Absolutely. All those little uh, graphics are widgets that you can create literally within seconds. And you, all you do is you hit the plus, create a widget, tell it what data to display, maybe the time range of the data, or and, and bang, it pops up on your screen. And just as easily, if you want to get rid of it, you can get rid of it. So, so the ability to post up almost like live sticky notes on that uh, uh, on that uh, on that interface with live sticky notes that actually are graphs of data that may change throughout the day and then peel them off and throw them away when they're not relevant that's exactly what we do there and uh, we think that's a real valuable asset for people trying to keep track of what's going on out there uh, I think you might have touched base on this, but just to clarify, does Redpoint integrate with any marketing automation systems or ad tech solutions? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we, we're integrated with, uh, we have 120 connectors to email providers, to content management systems, to digital asset management systems, to DMPs, uh, to email providers. Uh, to uh, CRM systems like Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics, uh, um, uh, various e-commerce systems like Hybris uh, and and other um, CMSs like Sitecore. So so you name it, we connect to it, we talk to it, um, and if we don't today. Uh, usually we can get a connector out within a matter of a few weeks or within the space of a sprint that we do every quarter. So, um, so th there's just a lot of flexibility there and we can definitely connect to uh, virtually anything that you want us to connect to. Uh, can I use this platform while using a hybrid approach to data where some of it will remain in my data centers? Absolutely, and and I would assume the other half of that is some of it resides up in the cloud, and absolutely you can do that. Um, Azure in particular has some very nice capabilities to do this kind of hybrid approach where you have logically one database, but the PII sits in your data center, and all of the uh, uh, dimensional data sits up in the cloud. Uh, but uh, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, and as we're running uh, close to the hour, I'm going to make this the last question. Um, can you please explain a little bit more of how machine learning works and its role it plays in optimizing value? Yeah, so machine learning uh, is a term that's now being used and abused, much like big data was, and it and it you know it, it's kind of being used for so many things that it's actually losing its meaning. Traditional machine learning uh, is the ability to develop models in an unattended self-training way uh, where you feed data to the algorithms and often through uh, uh, variations of different types of neural network uh, capabilities, they would uh, predict outcomes and, and do what predictive models do to a large extent. What we've done, and what we've done that's a little bit different, is we've taken machine learning in a very traditional sense. We actually have some proprietary algorithms around evolutionary programming and so on, and we use that to drive and create models. But what we also have is a simulation capability that sits on top of that, a very high speed simulation capability that allows us not to just use machine learning, but also optimize and find the best model. Because we have such a high-speed modeling engine in the machine learning, we can generate literally a million models per second. That simulator can then iterate through those models at extraordinary speeds against a fitness function that then it can optimize whether it's maximizing ROI or minimizing cost or whatever that metric is. And it's that exact power that really emphasizes the need for uh, being very, very thoughtful of what your strategy is and how it represents itself in metrics and in your, uh, your reporting and in your data. Because when you take a tool like machine learning, like optimized machine learning, like what we do, and you point it at a metric, it's going to drive that metric. So you've got to make sure from a strategic perspective that that metric is the right one for your business. Um, so machine learning, very exciting, very interesting, often an unknown for folks. And one of the things that we've done to try to minimize the 
you know, kind of the newness of it is that we make it really easy to use, number one. It's a drag, uh, it's a drop down menu to select machine learning. And it, you can actually use it and bake it off against more traditional methods just to see how it works to get comfortable. You know, let, let you play with it a little bit before you just get so comfortable that you say, drop the machine learning in there and let it learn and let it figure out what to do next. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, George, and thank, thank all of you for joining us today. I encourage everyone to check out the recording we'll be sending to you. And if you'd like additional information, you can visit redpoint.net or reach out to us via email at contact at redpoint.net. Thanks so much, and everyone have a great day.